You too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So nice. um, we'll give it a few seconds. It has actually already started, but I always like to give it a few seconds just to make sure. Are you looking at the YouTube feed now as well? <laughs> Not yet, but I will be soon. Okay. All right. Very high tech. All right. So we are live. I want to welcome everybody to our latest edition of Conversation with the Pros. Um, my name is Nicole Vargas, and I'm a professor of digital journalism here at San Diego City College. And I'm excited to bring you a very special guest. But before we do that, I want to remind you that this is a special production by City College News Network and the programs of digital journalism and radio, television, and film here at City College. And during the pandemic, our student journalists have been really working hard and have continued to thrive. And both programs are recruiting for fall 2020. And at the end, we will make sure to share with all of you the email addresses so you can get in touch with us if you're interested in joining the team. Um, I have a couple of students here who will be co-moderating this um, experience, this event tonight. And Christina Painton is a producer with New Scene. And that is our weekly student news television broadcast. And Vicky Pineda is our co-editor-in-chief of the City Times, our student newspaper and digital news website. And they are joining me today as an honor to welcome James Hever from formerly of the San Diego <laughs> Union Tribune, who just recently ended his time as theater critic for that publication, um, but definitely is, is now um, exploring new opportunities um, outside of the time that he was at the UT. And that actually was well over two decades, correct, James? Yeah, that's right. I, uh, I actually was at the paper for almost uh, 30 years, initially as a copy editor, and then um, as a writer, kind of general arts and features writer for about a decade, and then a uh, theater critic for a dozen, dozen years. Yeah. So... Uh, Can you give us a little bit of, a, to start, kind of set us up a little bit about your path. Um, talk sure. to us about how you came into um, theater and, and writing reviews and, and working that critical side of, of arts and entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I, your students are lucky to have you, Nicole. I, you're still a legend at the UT <laughs> as a sports writer. And Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's nice to see you again. Um, you know, I, I have to say I got a little bit of a, my path has been a little unusual and I got kind of a late start in both journalism and theater. I wasn't really a theater kid, although I, I you know, went to plays. I worked at a movie theater. I was like a popcorn sweeper, you know, that was my profession as a teenager. But um, I guess it really started for me, um, you know, I did work for my high school paper. And then uh, in college is really where uh, I went to San Diego State. I, I mostly grew up in San Diego. And um, I took a job as a proofreader and copy editor at the Daily Aztec because they were offering this paid position. And then realized how much more fun the, the writers were having, uh, you know, interviewing bands and doing all that stuff. And at the time, that was my main thing was I was really into music. Um, and, I, and around the same time, I guess I developed an interest in... Um, in, uh, I'd taken a poetry class and I'd been really, it kind of opened my mind to, to how much you could play with language, the things you can do with language. Uh, and those things kind of came together and I thought, you know, I'd, I'd love to try writing about something I love, which is music and the arts um, and, and kind of uh, explore, um, explore using language to express how I feel about it and what I'm seeing and what, you know, what I'm witnessing. Uh, and so I, I wrote, you know, started writing pieces for the Daily Aztec. And um, by the time I graduated, I was pretty sure I wanted to do journalism as a, as a career or at least give it a shot. <laughs> and, you know, this is going back a few years, but it's, I don't think it was much easier then than, than it is now to kind of break in. And I, um, I was working for a small, uh, like a uh, bi-weekly newspaper and um, kind of plugging away and thinking, you know, maybe if I go to grad school, I can leapfrog a little bit. Um, so I, I didn't actually study journalism in undergrad. I went to grad school at Columbia, New York for my journalism degree, worked for a magazine after that, and then um, moved back to San Diego and, and started at the UT again as a, as a copy editor because I had some experience in that. 
and kind of immediately, you know, started bugging them uh, to let me write. And I spent, I think I spent seven years contributing uh, reviews and feature stories outside of my regular job as a copy editor, just, just trying to convince somebody that um, they should, they should move me into a writing position. And um, eventually it worked. <laughs> um, persistence pays off. Also, I, you know, it also helped that I had another job offer and, and resigned and they said, well, wait a second, about that writing job, we think we might have something for you. And so I ended up, ended up staying. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think to boil it down, I think it really does come from a, a love of uh, language and having the privilege to try to express, um, you know, how I'm reacting to things I really appreciate in my life, like, um, uh, obviously the arts. Theater came along because uh, I was back up to the former theater critic, Emory Welsh, and um, was super interested in theater, had taken a lot of theater classes in, in college, um, but had never really been a participant in it. Um, but um, I, uh, I was sort of the backup reviewer on the theater beat at the UT, and then Emory uh, left and I was sort of the last guy standing and, and they, uh, you know, took me off the bench and put me in the, put me up at the plate, <laughs> probably mixing some metaphors here, but uh, um, yeah, so that was 12 years ago. And it, I really, I got to be honest, I did not know how it would be to, to be full-time immersed in, in theater it was such a sudden thing. And I hadn't really thought about it. I was kind of enjoying getting to write about a little bit of everything, but it was really an incredible experience. I feel just so privileged to have uh, had a chance to write about it for the past 12 years. And San Diego, as many of you know, I'm sure has a, has a really, I mean, right now it's uh, kind of on, you know, hiatus, but uh, it, it has an incredible theater scene and it was, you know, just uh, a privilege to get a chance to cover it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was hard to leave, um, but you know it's it's changing, uh, and it felt like um, felt like a good time for me to step away and and you know maybe get a fresh voice in there when things come back around. So that is my long winded response to your question, but <laughs> no, it's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to hear because I think a lot of students struggle with: do they major in journalism? Yes or no? Do they? Um, you know is that the only path? And if you major in journalism, is that the only path for you? And I think, you know, right. there's so many different pros and cons to both sides of it. And, yeah. and even, even where I sit, you know, I recommend to students, you know, it's, it really is a personal decision. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot to be said for, um, you know, majoring in, in something else, um, especially if there's something you have a passion about, mm -hmm. because that could become a, a specialty that you write about. Um, eventually or podcast about or or do tv about um but um you know not not to say that a journalism degree isn't valuable but i think um if you can get the practical experience um at the at the newspaper there or um you know an internship or or whatever then uh and then get kind of a broader background academically in another subject or other subjects i think that can be really valuable um and then there's always grad school. And I know that's, it's not for everybody, you know, it's, it's a time commitment and it's, you know, expend, it's, it's, it can be very expensive. Um, you know, for me, it was a way to sort of uh, um, get, get a little bit more um, academic experience in journalism and also just to um, have that on my resume, I guess, to sound mercenary about it. You know, you're always looking for a way to, distinguish yourself from other people in a competitive job environment. So I think it was helpful in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it's certainly not necessary. In fact, there are people who, plenty of people who are successful in journalism who don't, you know, get a college degree. Right. Um, so, yeah. So Christina, did you want to start with some questions? Sure. Um, thanks so much for letting us talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Thank you for having me. So uh, I guess one of my questions would be, in, in your opinion, what is something that has been really fun to write about uniquely 
um, specific to San Diego? Like what is the, the San Diego theater scene? What makes it really um, kind of stand out? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, one thing I would say is that, and, and you probably know this, San Diego has long been uh, a place where shows that end up elsewhere are developed. You know, there've been a lot of Broadway shows developed here. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been uh, kind of an amazing experience to get to see the very first stages of some of those shows. Like um, I remember back even before I was the theater critic, I, I got sent to do an advance, a preview story about this new musical called Jersey Boys, you know, that was going up a little playhouse. And I remember, <laughs> You know, I probably would make a terrible producer because I remember thinking at the time, like, all right, the Four Seasons, yeah, I kind of remember a couple of their songs, but is that really going to be? Do people care that much about the Four Seasons? And of course, it was a you know massive hit. It was one of the biggest hits of the past decade on Broadway, but it started right at La Jolla Playhouse, and so um, I think that's a, something that a lot of cities, a lot of other cities, don't have is that um identity as an incubator of new theater um with between La Jolla Playhouse and the old globe um the globe one of the last big shows they they did was almost famous um based on the Cameron Crowe movie and that was a like the most San Diego experience ever because <laughs> Cameron Crowe is from here mm -hmm. uh the movie actually mentions the old globe and shows a shot of it in the opening credits mm -hmm. And his mom, Cameron Crowe's mom, used to drag him to the Globe, and it's and it's set in San Diego. And then he brought them, he brought it here to make it from a movie into a musical. So he, it was just this like inception experience, you know, where the the show actually ended up being produced at the Globe. And you know, it seemed as though it was probably on its way to Broadway, and and may still be, you know, whenever Broadway comes back. But uh, I, I should say, and I just to finish answering your question because um, you know the big theaters here get a lot of glory um, and, you know, well-deserved. But I, I think the other thing about San Diego, and I, I'm pretty sure about this from talking to people in other, other cities, is that there's such a sense of uh, kind of cooperation and collaboration and partnership. And there are incredible small theaters like uh, Moxie Theater, um, you know, Intrepid Theater Company, uh, uh, you know, Signet, um, in Old Town, uh, Diversionary Theater, the LGBT Theater, just doing incredible world premiere work. Um, and, and they all tend to, to uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a sense of competition. There's a lot of, of cross fertilization. And from what I hear in other cities, it's not always the case. So I think that's a very San Diego thing and a very positive San Diego thing, I would say. Yeah. I hope that addresses your question. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. What's you, Vicky? Um, my question is, um, thank you for meeting with us, first of all. And then um, also, having your copy editing um, experience, how, it, how different is the writing between writing a regular article and then writing a review? Hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I was thinking about that before we started, um, because, uh, you know, writing a review I'll, I'll say on the one hand, obviously writing a review is journalism and you've got, you've got to follow basic tenets of journalism. You've got to, you know, you've got to be accurate. You've got to be fair. Um, I don't know how many, you know, you can, people can hate your opinion. That's one thing, but if they, if you misspell someone's name, that's when, you know, <laughs> that's when everything hits the fan. Um, and, you know, I can't blame people because it's maybe their, moment of glory and and you get someone's wrong someone's name wrong in a review it, it's um so so i would say that that's one thing that those journalism principles are equally important um on the other hand you know people talk about um obviously objectivity um and that's really important in news i think it means something different in uh writing reviews because i mean by its very nature it's your it's your opinion. It's your experience of how you um, how you interacted with this with this work, whether it's play or a record or or a movie. Um, and so it it really can't be objective, um, but it still can be fair. It still needs to be accurate. Um, and I, I do think that's where it's it's different. And I think that opens it up to your being able to write 
um, in a different in a different way to experiment a little more, which is one thing I, I loved about uh, writing reviews and features is you could um, you didn't have to follow you needed to follow those journalist journalistic tenets, but you didn't need to uh, follow a kind of a news formula like you know inverted pyramid. I don't know if they still Nicole. Does anyone still use? That? Oh yeah, okay. yeah we love it for the web. We love it okay. for the quickest way to hack it at, at the work. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't cracked a journal, journalism textbook in a long time, so I don't know. But yeah, I mean, so so yeah, that's uh, I guess I would say those are the two sides of that. Yeah. Now, when we have students who are checking this out from the theater program here on campus, obviously our yeah. journalism programs, um, but also in music, we have students interested in video games, in television, and radio, in in just pretty much every facet we especially since we've been home with the pandemic we've done a lot more review writing and it's been yeah. very natural for the students to you know gravitate to something that has been comfortable and, and tell their community about it whether you're watching and again going back to your experience with music whether it be theater when you're watching a performance what are you looking for specifically like what is it that your eye is trained to look for and is it different based on the type of review you might be doing um i guess i would say first and foremost um i'm all about looking for detail okay. um because i always feel as though um you really want to make the person your reader or your viewer mm -hmm. um feel as though they are experiencing this through, through your eyes. Um, and to me, that means making it kind of as vivid and specific as possible. I, I know people who, um, who will sit through play, people who, who write reviews who don't take notes. And, you know, and that's a, I, it's a valid choice. Everybody does things differently, but I'm like a obsessive note taker and it's hard, you know, doing it in the dark, but eventually it, you, know, you can sort of, figure out some of what you wrote but um i i just uh i think that uh helps cement in your mind as it's happening what you're experiencing and then I, obviously it gives you a reference point to go back and see what you thought was important in in that moment because that moment's gone um so um i think i'm straying away a little from your question a little bit but i i think that that sense of uh, specificity is really, uh, really important. And I, and I, th I think that um, you're giving, giving that sense of what it was like for you to experience that, um, that creative work mm. I think is really as important as your opinion on it, because your opinion needs to be grounded in something. You need to give people something to, to, to hang on to, so that they have some grounding for, for what you liked or didn't like about that. Um, about that work. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess it's different when you're writing about um, something that's not a live performance. If you're writing about, if you're reviewing a video game or something that's on tape. Um, but I still think taking notes is an, an important thing. Um, I don't mean to harp on that, but, but uh, to me, it's, it's, um, it just is part and parcel of trying to, trying to be as, um, you know, it's, it goes back to the old saw about uh, show and not tell. Um, you really want to have examples of uh, of what you're talking about. Yeah. So. Well, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Christina, you go ahead. What, what do yeah, you have? I have another question. Sure. Um, so what would you say are elements that make a review or, or um, a critique kind of, um, what would you say are the elements that make it really good that maybe a newer writer wouldn't pick up on or wouldn't know to um, to include. Yeah, um, I guess the first thing, and and maybe maybe this is fairly obvious, but I don't see it always happen. I I think that you I think that you need to start strong. You need to start with something that's going to hook the reader, and I'm sure that um, you've talked about and, and worked with the idea of, of leads, uh, you know, they really work. Um, and I, I always um, have spent a lot of time trying to craft a lead that I think is going to, you know, get, a, get, grab somebody, get a little, a little bit of attention from them. 
um, and also, you know, try to encapsulate what this piece is going to be about. Um, so uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I probably spend too much time <laughs> trying to craft the beginning of a, of a piece, but, um, you know, face it, if, if you don't, if you don't get the reader in, in that first moment, then they're gone. Uh, and if you, you know, you start with a paragraph that's like a massive block of gray that goes on for, you know, 200 words, I, I just don't think that's going to really cut it. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, I, um, you know, it's funny because after a while you can, when you're, when you're on deadline and you're having to write a lot of reviews and, and features, you, you can sort of forget about what you think about the craft and the, and the structure of it. I had to really, I had to think about this uh, beforehand and kind of write down some things um, about uh, the structure of it. Um, and so one other aspect that occurred to me is that I think that you can, people, a writer, a writer can fall into the trap of trying to summarize too much. Mm -hmm. um, and I see that even with professional writers that there'll be, you know, seven or eight graphs giving every specific of the plot of a play. And it's, it's really, um, it's not necessary. It's usually, it's almost always you, you need less summary than, than you think you do. Um, and the other thing is then you, you're giving away everything. <laughs> if someone's gonna go see that piece or, or go uh, experience whatever you were reviewing and you've already told them everything about it, it kind of defeats the purpose. So I think um, less is better as far as, as far as that goes. And um, that might be something that, that doesn't immediately occur to, to someone who hasn't been doing it because you, um, you, know, you, you think, well, I've got, to, I've got to let people know what's going on here. Well, you, you do have to give a framework. You have to give a sense of the piece, but um, you've got to leave room for your own uh, input to breathe kind of in it and not, not be just hemmed in by all this uh, plot summary or, or uh, just, you know, description in that sense. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, good question. How about you, Vicki? Um, similar to what you were just talking about, um, what's the quick turnaround for your, re so you go watch uh, theater uh, and then you have to turn it in. What's the quick review um, turnaround for your, the paper? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually um, was kind of lucky during my time at the UT because uh, I had a little more breathing room. Once upon a time, pretty much all the reviews were that night. Like you're, the deadline was <laughs> you, you know, the show ended, you booked to the uh, newsroom because, you know, it, uh, once upon a time, no one had computers at home. So, <laughs> so you had to go in, uh, write, and I think, you know, you had 45 minutes to an hour to write, uh, to make deadline. For me, um, it was always just because of the way, I think it's this way at most papers, by the way, now, but our um, feature sections were actually uh, not printed, uh, well, they were printed the next day. So there was no way you could write a review to get in the next day's paper. Um, so usually my deadline would be uh, like 11 a.m. the next morning. So it's still pretty quick. It's not a lot of time to really um, uh, meditate on, on what you saw. You know, there are tons of times where, you know, three days later, I think, oh man, this is what, okay, now I, now this makes sense. Here's what I should have said about that. You know, because um, uh, a play can be a, a complex thing. There are a lot of ideas um, flowing through, uh, through them. And so um, you don't always uh, have time to, you know, by the next day's deadline to, to figure out, um, to really to let it sit with you and figure out what you really thought about it. But on the other hand, you kind of have to. So um, yeah, yeah. So uh, long, long uh, answer short is that you, yeah, you had like 12, I had like 12 hours, had to sleep in there at some, some point. <laughs> but, uh, change your clothes, yeah. had to make it look like you changed your clothes. Right, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> so yeah. So um, kind yeah. of piggybacking on what you were saying with Christina, and 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 in that time, knowing that you had twelve hours, 
um, knowing that, you know, once upon a time, it wasn't even that long. How do you, because it is easy to maybe summary um, in that kind of time, because all you have to do is really focus on just the dump of what you saw, or maybe what's in your notes and just, okay, you know, act one, they did this, act two, they did that, act three. But, you know, your voice really, what sets one reviewer apart from another reviewer is, is the take, is the voice, is how you communicate your message. How do you keep your voice in, in the process and stay authentic and still kind of balance that, you know, fairness in the necessary, because obviously objectivity is kind of, isn't a, a necessary quality of reviews, but there's still yeah. a level of fairness um, yeah. in how you report. And how do you, how do you mesh all that together? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because that, that really is, that really does become the, the art to it. And, um, and it's, and I think what I would want to say about that first and foremost is that uh, to, to writers and just to not be afraid to, to be yourself and to put yourself into it because um, otherwise it's, it really is, you know, uh, just a recitation of, of, you know, sights and sounds. Um, I, I've found that I would try to do it oftentimes through humor, whether it actually <laughs> was funny or not. Um, and I think part of that is that you, you, you've got to be writing, you know, you've probably heard people say this, but you, you've got to, you've got to write for yourself as your own audience in some ways. And I think it's valuable to think about, um, what, what strikes you, what, what, uh, you know, what gives you, uh, what, what makes you happy, um, about writing or what, what, what really struck you about this piece that you really want to say that maybe seems too quirky or, um, or, uh, you know, maybe seems different than, um, you know, you, you want it to sound different than anybody else. And, and that will come through if you allow kind of your own, your own kind of idiosyncratic ideas to, to flow through. Um, I mean, and not to say that it's just going to be like a, a blurt on the page, but you got, I think it's important that you listen to your, um, to your own uh, intuition and your, your own tastes. Um, I think that's really the only way that that voice kind of comes through and, and you're right, Nicole, it's very, uh, it's crucial to, um, to writing in this kind of form because uh, you really, it really is about, um, you know, your, your reader hearing your voice and, and coming to know your voice mm -hmm. ideally and, and coming to trust you uh, in that sense and, and enjoy your writing as well as your opinions on things. So um, it's a hard thing to pin down, <laughs> you know, and it comes from your influences. I, I would go back to the, the idea that just personally for me, I, um, after I took a poetry class at San Diego State, I started reading poets and um, just really listening to the, the language and the way um, that there are these internal rhymes that you don't really think about. You don't, you don't think about them analytically, but you hear them um, and it plays in your mind. And, and that kind of thing always stuck with me. And I found that it would come out of my writing and I would really just enjoy sort of saying like, thinking like, how can I, what different word can I use that flows a little better in this sentence? Um, and that, that gives a more specific sense of, of what I'm trying to say. Um, I have a visual aid here. I, this is just one, this is a uh, Theodore Rethke. I think you pronounce his name. Um, I love his use of language. And, um, he was someone who, uh, I found like a little bit of an influence and people like T.S. Eliot, you know, I mean, and not to name all these, all these dead white men, <laughs> but because, you know, I, I love a lot of um, current um, writers and poets as well, but um, uh, yeah. And so sorry to stray off a little bit, but I wanted to, to just add that your influences are really important in that, in developing that voice um, and reading widely is really important. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think that's really a helpful thing. I'm re actually right now, I regret, I didn't get a chance to see this on Broadway, Slave Play. It, um, 
was in on Broadway in this last season and um, kind of a controversial but really um, striking play. And this is an example of somebody who really followed his own voice and, and wrote this, you know, um, uh, difficult uh, play that that really uh, brought something new to the scene. So yeah. Interesting. That'll be fun to watch when when we finally get Broadway back. That'll be. Know, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Christina, your turn. You're up. Yeah. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I wanted to ask you, um, what are some things that might make some reviews more difficult than others? I know that mm. you just mentioned this play that is kind of like controversial. Yeah. Um, so like what kind of goes into that? And how, how are the distinctions on that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. That's something that I confronted a, a lot because um, I'll, I'll give an example of getting, <laughs> I wish I had copied this letter, um, letter I got from a reader that was like the most negative kind of excoriating <laughs> reaction ever to a review where, uh, you know, he, this person ended his letter by saying, oh, you, you probably cheered when the Twin Towers fell. And it was just this rant. <laughs> and it, and the re it started because I was reviewing this play called uh, Hand to God. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It, it, was, um, it, was, kind of, it was on Broadway, uh, kind of this weird little play that ended up being a surprise hit. Um, and then San Diego Rep did it, I think about three years ago, they did the local premiere. And um, it's a play about this, this kid who's in, lives in a small town, very religious family. And he, his mom teaches Sunday school. I'm sorry, I shouldn't, this is like a long setup for this, but, <laughs> but um, they, just suffice to say, there's a lot of, um, it's a satire, but there's a lot of religious content. And, and some of the, um, some of the religious aspects are satirized. Although I think the playwright actually uh, really is sincere uh, mm. about his beliefs. But, uh, you know, when I, so when I wrote about it, it was a tough thing to write about because um, it's a sensitive topic, you know, um, sort of writing satirically and critically about uh, this, this playwright was writing satirically and critically about Christianity. And there were some pretty off color things going on in the play, um, some pretty controversial things. Um, and I found it, and and I didn't love the play. That was the other thing. You know, the most difficult reviews to write, I think, are when you have a mixed feeling about it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you love something, it's kind of in some ways easy to just be effusive about it. If you hate it, you know, it can be fun <laughs> to to be to be negative. Although I, I you know, I in the theater it's a different thing especially local theater because people aren't doing it for the money obviously and you don't want to like just tear people down for uh for for sport or for for really any other reason but um so that was that being a mixed uh my having mixed feelings about the play and then having to write about this controversial subject made that really difficult and then getting this kind of reaction which I, you know, kind of expected in some ways, um, not, not quite that, um, not quite that like vicious, but, <laughs> um, but I think this person who wrote to me uh, probably it should have directed his venom at the playwright because he was really, he was angry about the content of the play and I was just kind of the vessel for describing it in the newspaper, but I was the one who kind of took the heat, so. Um, and incidentally, the, that playwright, a couple of years later, came to La Jolla Playhouse with this this piece called the the Squirrels. <laughs> this really very strange play where everybody was dressed as squirrels, and it was this almost like a Lord of the Flies meets you know the Chipmunks or something. But um, anyway, so I interviewed him, and I had a chance to show him this letter, and said, "See what you you should have gotten this letter, not me." So. <laughs> Yeah, that, so, you know, I, I think that um, those two things, writing about difficult subject, writing a play that's about something difficult, and then also writing a mixed review, those are the times um, when I found it most difficult. And I guess the, I'll just add quickly, the third category is reviewing a really high profile play, because again, 
there are there have been a lot of works that went on to Broadway that began here, and there have been a lot of times when um, you know I was basically the first first person to write a professional review of of one of these works, and that felt like often a lot of pressure. Um, that was true for Almost Famous and uh, Diana, which the Diana, Princess Diana musical that debuted at Lily Playhouse and was supposed to hit Broadway in March and has been postponed. Um, so that, those kinds of things kept me up at night. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> part of the hazard, hazards of the job. There aren't many, but. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. How about you, Vicki? My question is, um, how would you avoid repetitive writing in an interview, in a review? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too, because uh, having to do um, so many of them, sometimes, you know, I don't know, three or four a week, sometimes it would ebb and flow, but um, I did find myself sometimes uh, getting in a rut and, and feeling as though I'm writing the same review over and over again, you know? You never want to start kind of boring yourself because then you can be pretty sure you're, you're boring other people. Um, so I guess I, I guess one way I would try to combat that would be to just come up with a fresh way to structure a review um, and try to break the rules a little bit, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I always, again, I always go back to um, finding something in the play that is something some specific uh, detail that is really telling or that you can that you can use to build a review around um, uh, I'm trying to think of examples I so I wrote that there was a, a play called uh, boom this um, kind of crazy but hilarious play about uh, the end of the world <laughs> And uh, it actually, it, there was actually stage script, uh, stage direction in the script that said something like, um, uh, you know, this is the note to the director. And now the world ends, uh, uh, find some way to do that, you know, on stage. <laughs> and that was all the playwright gave the director to, to go with. But, um, but anyway, I wrote this, when I wrote that review, I thought, how am I going to do this? How am I going to write about this in a way that does justice to the kind of the humor and the bonkers way the story is told? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the lead was something like, um, uh, God, if I can remember that, uh, how that went, it was like, uh, who hasn't sat at a play and, and wished a comet upon it? You know, um, so this idea that sometimes you're sitting in a bad play and you wish the world would end so it would put you out of your misery. But in this case, <laughs> it was actually not only a good play, but it sort of fit the, the theme of the, of the play, you know? Um, and that was, I guess, I don't know if that's a great example to go back to your question, but it is sort of breaking this rule about not having a, a question as a, as a lead. Um, and then also sort of going against the grain, like the person, a reader might think this is gonna be a really negative review, but it's not. Um, so things like that, I guess that's, that's how I would sort of try to break out of a rut a little bit is to just um, try to do something a little bit different. Um, and something that, you know, even if it, even if it didn't amuse anybody else, I kind of amused myself by, by writing that. So, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question though. As we see more digital reviews and as the students are, are you know, relying on out, outside resources to inform how they write their reviews, we're seeing some different trends, um, whether, again, no matter what the kind of review, whether it be a play review for one of our student plays, movies, you know, TV, um, one of the one of more of the um, more intense discussions that I've had with the with the news staff um, has actually been related to spoilers. And the idea that we, where spoilers play in, especially in the digital space with reviews, because now more and more people are turning to, you know, everything from, you know, whatever website is attached to the ticket right. that you buy for it. Or again, since we're home, you know, so often, you know, you can't even get something off Netflix without the reviews being literally part of it. Right. 
what's what are some trends that you see in kind of the digital space with with reviews that you like and some of them that you're like oh boy watch this is not going to be good <laughs> and, and <laughs> how does spoilers this this discussion about spoilers and oversharing what you're saying come into yeah yeah man it, it's tough i mean you're right there's so much of it out there and if you if you want to if you want the spoilers there you can find them right um i i was always very sensitive about you know, trying to err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. And a, a little bit of that goes back to that idea of, um, you know, not doing all this plot summary. Right. Um, you know, not trying not to give away. And there were actually times where I was contacted by theaters and said, well, you went too far with that. Um, huh. Yeah, you know, it's a judgment call. Um, I don't think I, I really tried not to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know, the, in the digital space, um, I know that it's. Uh, I know that that it's more. That kind of information is more available. I don't. I don't know that it should really change your approach, though, because, um, you know, I mean, on one hand, you could argue that um, if you're whatever you're reviewing, not everybody who's reading your review is going to go see that movie or that play or go mm -hmm. play that video game. Um, so, so why not just give them, give them everything? But I do think that there are enough people and, you know, maybe it just comes down to, I, I think I have maybe put spoiler alert <laughs> in a yeah. piece before. I don't know that that's, that's a little bit of a, yeah, a little bit of a cheat, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I would say, I'm not sure that the, the, the approach should should change, even if everybody else is kind of doing it. Um, yeah, but um, but it maybe depends on the genre too. You know, mm. okay. um, you know, yeah, because a play is something that you really only see once, and it, it's gone in a flash. So you want to hold back as much as you can. But um, if it's something you know, like a video game or or movie, where maybe you're gonna the part of the pleasure is watch, experiencing it over and over again, maybe spoilers aren't as important. So yeah, um, yeah it's probably different rules for different different forms. Okay. Yeah. And as far, we, we do have so many students and we are collaborating so much with, with organizations, with, with programs on campus where um, their specialty comes from the area of theater or music or, yeah. or cinema. Um, and, and then they come to us with the writing. Um, what are kind of your your best tips for those, um, you know, reviews written, like the, the non-journalist approach to review writing um, that all of us who are, who are giving them that copy editing feedback, um, if they yeah. come and ask for insight, they ask for help. What are some of the tips that we can give them to just kind of guide them into, kind of bring them into our world um, in a way yeah. that makes them comfortable, but still maintains their authenticity of their, of their craft? Yeah, that's interesting. So you have people from these disciplines who mm -hmm. want to write about the disciplines, yeah. which I mean is great. Coming from they're coming from a place of expertise, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that you know, the thing that springs to mind first for me is that um, if you're so immersed in something uh, and you're writing about it for a general audience, it can be a little, um, you know, the temptation or the maybe the tendency is to get a little too inside baseball. Mm, um, I, can, I can see that happening. Um, I didn't have as much experience with, with it, that kind of dynamic as maybe you do. We did occasionally have people from the theater world who wanted to, to write for us. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think it, um, yeah, there's there's that. And then there's also, um, you know, if you, if you don't come from a journalism background, um, we were talking before about playing with the form, but I, I do think that um, there's still kind of that template of, of you know, having a lead, mm -hmm. um, have, making sure uh, important things are, are mentioned. Um, uh, there was a, there was someone, uh, I think we had a, a freelancer write for us once, write a review for us where really the whole, uh, the whole piece ended up being um, kind of opinion that came from life background. And really the piece was hardly about the play at all. Um, and I think that can be a, a thing uh, with people who don't have experience in, 
in in journalism is you you really need to impress upon them that um, you you need to you're you're telling a you know in some ways a news story here you need to have you need to have names you need to have um, specifics you need to have tell us a little bit of what was going on and not just have it be a, uh, kind of a taking off a jumping off point for for your kind of musings about things <laughs> so point. yeah yeah um and i you know the other thing i would suggest that they read critics um to get a sense of it because i really do feel that reading um you know just organically and kind of by osmosis influences one's own writing mm -hmm. um you know i everybody has you know i, I assume people have their favorite critics like there's a guy named Anthony Lane who writes for the New Yorker. He's the the movie critic who's whose voice I love, and he's I think he's hilarious. And um, you know he gets to write in this long form because it's the New Yorker. But yep. um, but yeah, I, I think you know reading reading people in in the field is probably a, you know maybe give them a little homework assignment <laughs> in that right. sense. Yeah, yeah. And I do want to say though, can I piggyback on that a little yeah. quickly? Because um, one thing that I regret, I didn't get a chance to really um, bring to fruition when I was at the UT was I really wanted to bring in new voices, more diverse voices, younger voices. And, um, you know, both in my job at the UT and as part of the San Diego Theater Critic Circle, which is a group that, I, you know, we have a big award ceremony every year, we get scholarships. And I, uh, you know, I try. I tried through those two forums to find a way to to bring in voices that we aren't hearing, critical voices. Um, and uh, ideally, you know, I, I was hoping to have somebody, um, maybe as as an apprentice who could um, be ready to step up. Um, you know, when I left, and then I left sooner than I expected, and now there's no theater for the time being. Right. But I think that those places you're talking about, the people in those disciplines could be a really uh, uh, important, um, just a, a place for, to find those, to find those voices. Mm -hmm. and, and all of you, um, I would hope would, would be um, interested and, and enthusiastic maybe about being those people as well because we need you yeah. <laughs> the culture needs you the society needs you um we need your your voices we need your take on things and right. um, so so please you know get be you know get get your voice in the mix um yeah uh wh whatever background you come from even if it's not a traditional writing background if you know you have something valuable to say so yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll keep working on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to give the honor of the last question to Christina. I, I went on um, too long, sorry. No, this, was, this has been fantastic. This is perfect. So, Christina, please feel free. The, the last question is yours, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, just going off of what you just said, um, you mentioned you wanted to kind of pass the baton to an apprentice. And, you know, as, as a student, as a student's listening in on this call, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, how does one, how does somebody get into that position of maybe like being yeah. an apprentice to somebody like you who yeah. is doing this professionally? Yeah, um, you know, I would say, um, as you probably know, the, the newspaper business has been, uh, has had its struggles and, and has, we've had a lot of cutbacks. Um, I say we, I'm not officially there anymore, but um, so, so it's the, staff positions are kind of in short supply but i i you know they they exist still and i think probably right now the the best route is to um to to freelance to, to contact an editor and try to form a little relationship and and just um present some of your work um because there's a need there's there's a big need for um for writing for copy um I know, I really, I know for a fact right now that at, at the UT, there's still, thankfully, the, the management is still committed to um, to having arts and culture and, and um, you know, having that kind of coverage. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I think that there should be freelance opportunities, if not you know, immediately down the road. And I'm, I'm sure that's true for other publications. Mm -hmm. So I think right now that's kind of the most realistic way to make yourself known um, is to you know, get your get your writing in front of an editor's eyes. Um, and I, you know, if uh, Nicole, if you want want to do this uh, afterward, I can um, I can do my best to supply you know some some contact information. Perfect. Yes, uh, please. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I love that you are interested, and uh, yeah, there there are you know as I say, it's it's kind of never been easy, but uh, I think. Um, I think there's still interest there. And I, th I think that, um, you know, getting your, your work um, in, in front of people, uh, you know, in a, on a freelance basis to begin with anyway, is probably the best, uh, best route to go. Uh, and, you know, if you have published work um, to, to show, uh, that's very helpful, you know, to, to, to show that, that you can, that you've, you've uh you're committed to this and that you've you've done some writing you've had it published um that's certainly important so mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> no this helps this helps so much and i really you know I, I think i speak on behalf of the students all the students who are here and and um 